Okay, hello and welcome everyone. So in this video, I'm going to give an overview of substitution and income effect, and I'm gonna give you sort of the version of what's gonna be important for the course. Yeah, yeah, I'm taking inspiration from Varian's Intermediate Micro, but Varian goes far beyond what I'm going to expect and what I'm going to cover here. And so this is going to be like what, what students in the class, in the course are responsible for. All right, so we're gonna think about the effects of a price change, namely the substitution and income effect. And I'm gonna explain this a couple different ways, a couple different pictures, and then there's gonna be three slides that the whole lecture is gonna be kind of distilled down to. And I'll point it out, I'll say, this is the most important series, you know, section of the lecture. And that's what you wanna focus on. Oh, and I realized I did not make my screen large enough, so sorry. All right, so when there is a price increase, for instance, we can decompose the effect into the substitution effect of the price change and the income effect. The substitution effect is gonna be the change in quantity that the consumer is demanding when the price rises, other things constant, including other prices and utility. So at constant utility, consumer is gonna buy the relatively cheaper alternative. Price of one good rises, now the other good's relatively cheaper, so that you're gonna buy more of that other good. The income effect is the change in quantity of the good the consumer demands because of a change in income, other things constant such as prices of other goods and then um, in utility. So an increase in the price will reduce the consumer's buying power. Effectively, this reduces the consumer's income and the budget set. So the consumer is gonna buy less of at least some of the other goods. You can think of like the budget constraint kind of rotating in or shifting in or something like that. So the budget set's smaller. The total change due to the price increase, it's the sum of these two effects. We introduced compensated demand in the previous lecture. Generally, utility decreases when the price increases. Suppose when prices change, the consumer's income was adjusted to allow them to remain at the same level of utility, stay in the same indifference curve. This lets us illustrate the income and substitution effect, right? We can think again, the substitution effect, that's the effect on consumer choice of changing the price ratio, leaving utility unchanged. The income effect is the effect on consumer choice of changing the feasible set, leaving the price ratio unchanged, right? This is gonna keep the same slope of the budget constraint. This is going to give a different slope to the budget constraint, right? That's how we're gonna, that's how we'll distinguish between the two graphically. So here's the first motivating picture. A price change causes a change in utility, right? So here we have an increase in the price of good X, right? The budget constraint becomes cheap, uh, becomes steeper, cheaper. Budget constraint becomes steeper, the good became more expensive. Good two becomes relatively cheaper. We're gonna be on a lower indifference curve. U2 is gonna be lower than U1, assuming better indifference curves are to the Northeast as we have in the course. The compensated price change would be, suppose we shift, suppose we compensate the consumer by giving them enough income to be back at their original utility level. So now they're going to, will right shift their budget constraint, right? So step one, budget constraint rotates in, becomes steeper. They're on a lower indifference curve. Step two, we'll compensate them by shifting out their budget constraint effectively. And now they'll optimize by choosing this bundle here. Now, interestingly, what's really happening is the consumer started here, they're gonna end there. But we're gonna make this hypothetical jump, this hypothetical step that doesn't actually happen because we don't actually compensate them, we don't actually give them this money. But if we did, this allows us to separate out the income and substitution effect, and that's the goal here. Suppose the, cons so we'll do this carefully. Suppose the consumer has Cobb Douglas preferences, faces a generic budget constraint. Suppose the price of good one doubles. The new budget constraint is therefore twice as steep. The budget constraint, the budget set is smaller, right? We're, we're losing bundles that could have previously been consumed, now are no longer affordable. The area between the new budget constraint and the old budget constraint reflect this change in the budget set, right? We lost this triangle right here. We lost this region when the price doubles because we lose, we could have previously consumed all these bundles, now we can't, we can all, our feasible set is just this, right? That's what's happening. Now at the original budget constraint, the consumer is gonna buy this bundle one, when the price of good one rises, the consumer is gonna buy bundle two, that's this picture. So at the original prices, the consumer's at, at bundle one, at the subsequent prices, the consumer's at bundle two. I've put this question mark as the hypothetical bundle the consumer doesn't actually get, but we're saying suppose we were to compensate them. So I put a question mark. I really wanted to put like exclamation point or like the imaginary number, maybe like the imaginary number sy symbol or something like that, I, 
um, which always remember I think of the imaginary number I I always think of the sequence in the movie proof where they're talking about the band that just sits silent during the song that's entitled imaginary number you have to see the movie never mind um, all right so Note that the increase in price of good one to doubling the price of good one causes the budget to rotate, right? It went from BC1 to BC2, rotates in, right? Now we create an imaginary budget line, BC question mark, with the same slope as BC2 and tangent to indifference curve one, right? So BC question mark is this one because it's imaginary because it didn't actually happen. So that's what the question mark's doing. Ultimately, I'm going to replace these with letters. I'm going to do that in, other, in case, I don't know, maybe this se sequence, maybe you want to see this differently, so I'm going to do that in a couple slides. All right, but I want to reinforce that this budget line is imaginary. We're not actually giving them the money. They're not actually going to consume budget bundle question mark. However, the shift of the optimal bundle from one to two is a total effect. That's what actually happens. The substitution effect is the movement, hypothetically, from one to question mark. The income effect is the movement from question mark to two. The substitution effect is the change in quantity demanded from the compensated change in the price of good one. Suppose we increase income by, by enough that utility stays constant. Then the total effect of the price change is broken down into a substitution and income effect. Again, the substitution effect is a change in quantity demanded from a compensated change in the price of good one. If we increase income by enough to keep the utility constant, offsetting the price increase, we drew our imaginary budget constraint, BC question mark, parallel to BC2 and tangent to the original indifference curve. This is how we made the picture. For BC question mark to be tangent to indifference curve one, we need to increase the budget to offset the harm due to the price increase. If the true budget constraint were BC question mark, indeed the, qu the consumer would choose question mark, bundle question mark, and that would be the pure substitution effect. The income effect, the change in income is due to the change in price, P1, which allows the consumer to buy less with the same budget. It's captured by the parallel shift of BC question mark to BC2, an effective decrease in income. That was the movement from question mark to two as the consumer is becoming relatively poor because the price of good one has risen. All right, so in case you liked the previous even less than I did, I really didn't like it very much. We'll do this a different way. Well, different. I'll explain it differently, the same logic. Decomposing these effects, the substitution effect, the consumer always substitutes the less expensive good for the more expensive good. That's just simple microeconomic theory. Holding utility constant. So this is a movement along an indifference curve. So the substitution effect would be if we could keep them on the same indifference curve, you'd move along the indifference curve, changing the composition of your bundle such that you stay on the same indifference curve, but respond to the price change. The income effect, the consumer shifts to a new income or new indifference curve, and the direction depends on if the good is normal or inferior, right? And so we'll actually see that, that'll kind of, kind of pin down this logic a little bit better. All right, so here's an increase in the price of good one and the hypo hypothetical income compensation. So we increase the price of good one, budget constraint becomes steeper. So we originally were consuming bundle A, now we consume bundle B. Right? Suppose we were to hypothetically compensate them with income just as we were doing before. This is like bundle one, bundle two, bundle question mark. Now let's call that bundle C. And then I'll, that we're coming up to the sequence that's super important from the slide deck. So the compensated budget constraint is this one. This is where we'd be giving them enough income to be able to consume along the original level of utility after the price of good one has increased. This is important. So this is the sequence of slides that are super important. So what's happened is going from bundle A to bundle B to bundle C. The price rises, the income and substitution effect gets us from A to B. The substitution effect gets us from A to C and the income effect gets us from C to B, right? Whoops, substitution effect gets us from A to C, income effect from, uh, from C to B relative to this picture right here. Okay, if we have a normal good and the price of good one rises, the substitution effect brings us from A to C, income effect would bring us from C to B, right? If we were, if we were compensated, if, if we had normal good, um, A to B, substitution effect, income effect would bring, us back to, uh, would bring us back to C for a normal good. 
uh, or sorry, A to C and then and then C to B. So we just be moving in the same direction, A to C and then C to B for a normal good. Uh, if we have a typical inferior good, the substitution effect is going to bring us from A to C, but then the income effect is bringing us back to B. So we'd have to draw B between A and C if we have an inferior good, right? So this is the picture for normal good. C would have to be, uh, B would have to be between A and C for an inferior good. For a Giffen good, oh, we have B to the right of A. So substitution effect brings us from A to C. The income effect would bring us all the way back to the right. To the right means more of good one, right? The Giffen good is where the price of the good rises and you buy more of that good. All right, let's see that logic. Here's the pictures that go with it. Here is the income and substitution effect for the inferior good, right? So the price of the good rises. Here's my new budget constraint. Here's the bundle I actually get. But what's happened is like my substitution effect brings me to here. My income effect brings me back to B, right? My substitution effect brings me A to C. My income effect brings me back to B. And so here, what's happened, we have an inferior good. The price, so fact, remember, with an inferior good, what's happening? The price of the good rises. I'm becoming relatively poorer. But because I'm becoming relatively poor and because good one is inferior, now I want to buy more of that good. Right? That with inferior goods, you buy more of the good when you become relatively poor. That's all that's happening there. Now with the Giffen good, what's happening? This is weird, right? This is for a strongly inferior good. An inferior, a Giffen good is a strongly inferior good. The substitution effect when the price rises is bringing me way back here to C. The income effect is bringing me all the way out here. So the price of good one has risen. My budget constraint becomes steeper. Nevertheless, I buy more of good one. Look, B is my final bundle. Ultimately, I'm going from A to B. This C is always just a hypothetical bundle. Ultimately, I'm going from A to B. And what's happened now with the Giffen good is I have the substitution effect that brings me to C. The income effect is bringing me all the way back to B. Remember the story with the Giffen good. The price of the good rises. I'm becoming relatively poor. We're thinking of something that's occupying a large proportion of my budget like some staple food or something, something that I absolutely have to have to get. Now as I become, as I keep buying it because it's what I need to survive, I'm also relatively poor, so I have less money to spend on anything else. So I'm gonna put everything I have towards that inferior good, I'm gonna buy more of the inferior good, which means the total amount of good one, which is a strongly inferior good that I buy, it's gonna be more than I started with before the price increase. So the story would be, suppose we have something that I'm, I'm completely beholden to. I don't know. When I was in grad school, I ate a lot of potatoes. I was super poor. So pa potatoes are the big staple in my diet. But I'd also buy some snack food and some other types of things on campus. Okay, suppose I would have become, suppose the price of potatoes would have risen. I probably wouldn't have any money left over to buy snack food or things on campus. So I just buy more potatoes. So that'd be like the gift and good story, right? I've become relatively poor because the price of the good rose. It's an inferior good to me. I don't eat that many potatoes as I used to. However, if you have one good that's occupying a large proportion of your budget and you keep buying it and the price rises, you're now relatively poor. So when you're relatively poor, you buy more of the inferior good. That's why the strongly inferior good is a gift and good. All right, so relative to this picture and relative to this picture, so normal good is captured by this image right here. The inferior good is captured by this image. And the Giffen good is captured by uh, this image. And those collection of what? Is that five slides? One, two, three, four, five. That collection of five slides are the most important from this slide deck. So, all right, I'm going to go ahead and conclude here. I sure hope you enjoyed the video, and I'll see you next time.